just for the record, this is the February Tuesday, February 27, 2024 meeting of the Arlington Artificial Turf Study Committee. Um, good to see most of everyone back. Um, I think we had a really great meeting last week. Um, and I'm really glad uh, to have heard from Ian Lacey and, uh, and also to begin the discussions about the bullet points. So in general, I felt like uh, we're really starting to hit our stride just in the nick of time too. Um, we don't have minutes to approve this meeting. So Sorry. we have a double set of minutes at the next meeting, but um, I think you'll be getting those minutes soon from last meeting. It's uh, Natasha is a miracle worker, but you know even miracle <laughs> workers have have a have a day have a day you know have a day off every now and again, or especially during a school vacation week. So um, more than more than okay if we have to wait an extra meeting. I, I know I know some committees you know it's uh, months later they get their minutes, and, and uh, I'm not saying that's the best practice, but uh, it's nice to get them uh, always the next week. And you do such a great job, so thank you, Natasha. Thank you. With that, Jim, I will just say that um, I believe the meeting the video has been posted. Um, to our website, as well as the presentation that we had last week. So even though that'll all be included in the meeting minutes, um, we were able to get those things up. So I apologize, um, folks, for the inconvenience and extra reading that you'll have at the next meeting, but <laughs> gymnastics called. <laughs> I, I have to say, I'm probably not speaking to too many people here because I see most people were at our last meeting, but if you weren't, I can't uh, stress uh, urge enough to, to review the video, the whole video. Of the meeting because it was um well at least to me it was very illuminating and very helpful um and answered a lot of outstanding questions we had that you know we hadn't quite found someone who could answer and ian was uniquely positioned to answer a lot of questions about costs and the the, the differences between the two surfaces and just sort of a practitioner's point of view on these things so um Yes, if you haven't had a chance, it's worth the hour and a half to watch to watch uh, that last meeting. Um, so, you know, we initially heard moving on to the next agenda item, the most important, you know, discussion of the, you know, the first deliverable from each of the working groups. Uh, we had started with the environmental group last week Jim. and Mike walked. Yep. Sorry. Do you want me to just do the correspondence received first? Oh, yes, of course. Sorry. <laughs> nope, it's okay. Um, that's my job, right? Keep us on, on a little bit of the, the track here. <laughs> All right, so the correspondence we received um, last week, we received quite a bit. Um, the first is an email from Robin Bergman, and I apologize if I butcher anybody's name, I'm terrible with that. Um, this was in regards to t an article, Tiny Particles of Plastic um, Now Pollute Our Food, Water, and Even the Clouds. Um, we received an email from um, Wanell Evans, and we had five, um, links, which I did try to provide. I'll get to that in a second. Um, the first one was about acute exposure to microplastics, um, induced changes in behavior and inflammation in young and old mice. The second one was a um, uh, the Mindero Monaco Commission on Plastics and Human Health. The third was a CDC um, fact sheet on PER and poly or PFAS. Um, the fourth was an article, I believe, from Politico. Um, our community has been deceived. Turf wars mount over PFAS. Uh, and the fifth was PFAS-free synthetic turf standards. I believe this was a report um, that was sent along. And we had an email from Beth Malofchik, um, who sent over two links. One was uh, personal injury firms look for people exposed to PFAS from Joint Base Cape Cod. And the second was why parents and coaches of cancer-stricken athletes are worried about artificial turf. I do just want to clarify um, to the group, um, we had some difficulties with the size of the packet this past week. So I was unable to send everybody the entire, what I try to do is include the links um, so that you don't have to go searching for them. In one case, I know in, um, I think it was Beth Moffchick's, there was a, a large document and I, I could only provide the first five pages. So I, I do apologize, but you would be able to, and I think I made that um, in the notes as well, that uh, you'd be able to just click on that link and, and read the full thing. So um, apologies for that. I think we're just getting to a point where the, the packets are getting a little big. So um, I'll continue to do my best to include everything that I can. Um, 
but in the event that that I can't, I'll I'll make some sort of a note so that folks know. Thank you. Um. Yes, I think that's. I think if we're all we're all good, Natasha. I think to move on. So, uh, we began by hearing from the environmental group last week, and we'll sort of pick up where we left off with the other two groups, uh, health and safety. And um, I think I might do chairman's prerogative to uh, to let. Uh, well, actually, I, I think my prerogative would be that I'd like the health group to go next. So, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, does anyone from Marvin, Natasha? So we're going to divide it up so that yeah, divide and divide it up so that you don't have to um, listen to everything at once and break it up to different parts we can talk about. Um, yeah. So I was going to start just um, with we came to a consensus that we thought the major three topic areas for both natural natural and artificial fields were access to sports and its impact on mental and physical health heat impact on human health, um, and then heat impact associated with the chemicals found in natural and artificial fields. Um, and our topic areas, we are going to proceed in that order, but they don't um, reflect an order of importance. In fact, I think we find that different people would find different areas of more importance. Um, so our first area is access to youth sports and its impact on mental and physical health. And so we feel that we found enough research that said exercise, in particular team sports, improve the overall health of young people. Um, and Arlington should consider working on how to increase playing spaces to ensure equitable access to team sports for all its young residents. It should be in considered that artificial turf may uniquely be positioned to allow for continuous play when adverse weather conditions restrict play on natural grass fields. Um, and so under that topic, we had two bullets that really looked at participation in youth sports as impacting both physical health and mental health. Um, and the idea that um, lack of playing space really impacts um, our most needy um, children in town, because those are the children who are most likely to rely on public sports. Um, and then seasonal weather. And we really focused in on, I think we had the discussion here that the shoulders, the March to June and August to November season, um, there just is a lot of impact by weather conditions and the artificial turf would increase playability during those times. Um, and so we felt like our gaps and limitations to research were really the fact that there is no article that says artificial turf lets kids have better health. It's just artificial turf if it increases the ability to play and allow more kids to play becomes important. Um, so in that case, we would want to know, would adding artificial turf fields increase access to playing times and practice times? And will add a Artificial, adding artificial turf fields actually increase enrollment. Um, and so our mitigation there was to be really careful if we were to use artificial turf in selecting sites that actually would increase the ability for students to have access. So we don't, we're not condoning just putting artificial turf in to put it in, but putting it in in a way that meets that goal for this one subset. Um, so I don't know if we if people had questions of what else we may need to include there. Yeah, Jim, do you want us to kind of pause here and we'll go through each of our sections or do you want us to go through the whole report? You can pause if there's questions, yeah. but if there isn't, I'll just keep going. Any thoughts, questions, concerns, or think that we need to look at other things, Mike? Yeah, just a, a quick question. I think that you made some interesting and good points, Jill. Uh, my question is, uh, in, and it may come up in the next couple of uh, points that you mentioned you're going to be talking about, uh, sort of balancing the playtime uh, versus uh, any of the negative health impacts that have been discussed. Yeah, those will those will come up. So this was the like, I guess the benefit piece. 
Um, right. But I think that has to be balanced with the next two sections and our concerns and mitigations in the next two sections. Great, thanks. So if there's no other questions, um, I don't really have anything that I wanted to add to that. Marvin, I don't know if you have anything that you wanna add to that specifically. Um, I'm gonna tackle um, the heat impacts on human health. Um, so we acknowledge that, um, you know, climate change, we're going to continue to, to see this warming effect and that it, it's, uh, I'm just gonna read right off here. Um, this may become an increasingly important issue as we continue to see the warming effects of climate change. Um, the concerns are that artificial turf does have a higher heat load than natural grass, we acknowledge that. Um, in addition, in all types of playing surfaces, exposure to high heat levels has a cumulative effect on the human body. Um, children are also more vulnerable to high temperatures than adults. And for those reasons, um, we are leaning towards education and um, think that there are mitigations are essential in terms of um, being able to ad address these issues in both artificial turf as well as natural grass. So um, within that, we have um, three bullet points here. It, it, we talk about heat related illness um, being you know, a cumulative effect we've found um, with our studies that several days of heat exposure can be detrimental. In fact, you can be exposed on one day um, and then a couple of days later be exposed again and can still have a residual effect. And so that's something that we want to um, you know, acknowledge and, and definitely whatever you know, we're moving forward with, um, make sure that that's taken into consideration. Um, we do think that there may be a lack of awareness by coaches and players of the signs and symptoms of heat stress um, and that there may not be the most appropriate remedial actions. I think when we heard from the athletic uh, trainer from the high school, that was really awesome and great to know that they have some, some policies and protocols in, in place there. I think, um, you know, it raised some questions that we still have about, you know, maybe some of the other user groups and are there ways that we can continue to educate those in, in one way or another um, and bring more awareness to that. Uh, as I said, we acknowledge that there is a difference between the, the natural grass and the artificial turf fields on both the surface and above surface. And these can certainly lead to um, heat stress for, for players, potential for burns. Um, and I think, you know, one of the pieces here that we'll talk about is, you know, there, there, is, there does seem to be an impact, whether it's, it's really a large enough impact or not, on um, the infill color. So using a black material versus a say green or what have you. So just acknowledging um, that as well and, and what that temperature difference is. I think some of the gaps in, um, in our research, uh, you know, we were, were trying to compare, you know, the loss number of um, comparison of the days lost to rain within the, the, the shoulder seasons. Um, and then also, uh, you know, those days that are the higher heat levels. Um, so, you know, how many days are, are we losing in, in the hot, hot heat um, where, you know, potentially artificial turf could be shut down and or, a, you know, um, a regular grass field as well. So kind of considering both of those. So um, I think one of the challenges is like accurately assessing the air temperature above the field. So we know that the high school has a wet bulb um, thermometer, but we don't know that that's necessarily accessible to other user groups. And so figuring something out in that regards, as well as, um, you know, the surface temperature, I think the infrared um, devices are, are typically used on those. Um, but I'm not sure how much of that we can really say there's just a little bit of gap of, of information there in terms of what the surface temperature um, may be doing there uh, in terms of the, the player there. Um, what is currently done for the heat? So, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so one of the questions um, that we know is that there is currently some training in place for, um, you know, the user groups at, at the high school, the coaches, um, but again, that, that outside population, um, that doesn't fit within the MIAA or, or the school regulatory piece. Um, and then some of the mitigation measures um, that we talked about, we feel that there are definitely mitigation measures that can be put into play here, um, such as, you know, uh, there have to be, th there should be some guidelines around when a field can be played on, um, whether artificial turf or grass. I think, you know, we do see that sometimes in the summer months or, or in, in late August when we've got folks having uh, you know, double sessions or, or what have you, that um, they move them around so that they're at different times of day. Or um, if it's just too high, I remember playing soccer a long, long time ago. And because of the, the temperature, um, 
you know, they would cancel games uh, in those high heat. So I think, you know, making sure regardless moving forward, whether it's this group um, determines artificial turf is, is good or, or not, um, or we determine just grass, I think either way, the guidelines, um, we should have some sort of clear guidelines to help us with um, making those those decisions to address the, the heat impacts on the user. Um, we, we loved that the high school athletic trainer talked about the acclimatization for um, for the football players and wanted to explore a little bit more about, you know, what, what that might look like for other user groups if um, that's a possibility. We thought um, there's definitely ways that we can raise awareness um, related to um, heat illness for the coaches and players. And one thought that we had is, you know, I know that the recreation department has to issue permits and, you know, we're wondering if at some point there may be a possibility to attach something to that permit being that, you know, um, the coaches or whoever is is accepting that permit is also, you know, checking off that they've gone through a training. And we acknowledge that that's not 100 percent, but it's it's a step in the right direction, I think, um, to have something like that in place. Um, then we also are looking at, um, you know, if there are artificial turf, um, you know, proposals that there be built in mitigations for heat reduction, such as shade structures. Um, reflective in color and wherever possible grass fields. Also, this is important. I think, you know, moving forward, um, if we've got a grass field that doesn't have enough cover in the area, you know, perhaps providing being able to construct benches that have a cover overhead um, so that you can keep those those kiddos out of that hot sun if um, if at all possible. Um, so just some some thoughts on on that. I will stop there and Joe. Hi. So as I was hearing you talk, I mean, this is where I get a little, I don't know, perplexed may not be the right word, but I know our charge is artificial turf, right? Yeah. But also our charge is looking out for the health and safety of Arlington residents. And that's why we're doing this report. As well it, as a comparison of artificial turf right. to natural grass. Yep. It's a very slippery slope. When if you know everything you just said, you you could attribute that to all of our tennis courts in town, all of our basketball courts in town, um, all of our our rubber surface playgrounds in town. Um, heck, all of Mass Ave. You know, are we going to start regulating? Um, all yeah, all all our our running tracks. Imagine trying to close the running track on a hot day or the pickleball courts or people sitting down at Mass Ave on the bench. I mean, it just it just becomes a very slippery slope on what we're trying to control as far as, you know, temperature, excessive heat temperature. I think obviously the difference would be, you know, they're playing potentially, you know, running around on the field and they're, you know, extend, extenuating themselves. So I don't know, I just, I just, I just want to be careful because I hear Natasha saying we should have shade structures and, and I know why you're saying it, you know, at, at parks and we could have covers on benches and we could have things attributed to the permit and we could have training all very positive. I think we could do that for, our, for me, certainly the organizations maybe who were undertaken, you know, the load of getting the permit. I, I just want to cautious us for not taking on the uncontrollable, right? Where all of a sudden we you need a permit to do everything and be able to take a training test to use a playground and not being able to play pickleball if you want, even though if say you wanted to play pickleball on a day that's 95 degrees, but you took water breaks every 10 minutes or you hydrated or wore a ball cap or you were in excellent shape and it wasn't a concern to you, it was your freedom of choice to do that. So anyway, yeah. I'm just I'm just Raising so a little is, bit of a no, and that is such a valid point. And I think that was absolutely not our intention. I think the intention was more like, you know, if there's an organized type of sport and there's a way to, you know, if someone's, I don't know, I'm thinking, you know, a soccer club or, or what have you, I'm not thinking, you know, I'm going to go down to the track and I'm going to run three miles. Cause I'll tell you right now, like that's been me on a really hot day. I don't care what it says. I'm going to go do it because I want to get my exercise in. Um, is it a good idea? Probably not. Like, I don't think that we can control all of those individual things. Um, and in terms of, you know, like the, the shade structures and things, I think that that's just a consideration. You know, I think if there's a way 
to consider it into a plan, maybe it's a good idea. I don't even know how much that would that would cost. Yeah, um, no, I, and I, I, I hear Natasha. I, I just think you know, when I read through the packet, yep, and you know certainly a lot of the articles and you know the Philadelphia, yep, like Philly's article, wherever it was. That, you know, I just I just want to be you know I'm not saying artificial turf is perfect, but I think it sometimes gets the blame for a ton of stuff that could be attributed to many, many, many things in our lives that quite frankly, probably many of us wouldn't give up. And when that, whether that's PFAS, has PFAS in it, or whether it's dental floss, it has PFAS in it or whatever it is, right? Um, and, and, and I just don't want, you know, out of, I know that's our charge, but I'm just having trouble thinking out of fish drugs being this thing that's just getting hit over and over and over yep. and over again. Um, when it's it's really plastics is a problem for the computer I'm holding the pen I'm holding the with my phone case I mean I, it's the table cover and I just again I just want to raise the flag that I just it just makes me pause and think like are we trying to over regulate yeah certain things so I'll shut up I just know what is sort of important is that we really felt when we were looking at heat that some of these have to be incorporated in new design of fields, whether it's grass or turf, because it's going to be hotter. And so I don't think we were proposing that we take and require all fields to be redone. But if you're redoing a field and you're making a baseball field, providing a covered bench seems to make sense at this point, whether it's a turf or non-turf field. Um, and, and I think what we recognize with heat is yes, heat is gonna be hotter, but the world is hotter too. And we have to, you know, we have to recognize that in general. And we're hoping that, you know, as people continue this conversation, they recognize that heat is a problem, whether or not, whatever type of surface we're using. Yeah, I would just add to that, Joe, I think you bring up some really good points. And I appreciate that. I think that we're a fortunate committee and that we don't have to look at all those things. We only have to look at the turf fields. And I think that if we focus on that, we got enough to do. Uh, but I think that uh, I understand what you're saying about, uh, you know, the next steps uh, that might might occur or might come up to somebody's attention. But I think that if we just focus on what our small niche is, I think that'll make life a little easier for us. So, Joe, I just want to follow up to, and um, I'm sorry, Mike, did I cut you off? No. Nope. Okay. I just want to follow up to um, how or what do you think in the report like we should because I want to understand like what what you're reading from this report you have to be comfortable with too right so like what what do you think that we're maybe not um, highlighting enough of or are we no, focusing no. I, okay I, I, I think it's it's excellent I mean, this is everything that we it's, we read as well in our okay. you know um, safety group and I, I don't know I'm just thinking of some type of caveat or an asterisk yeah. or something that says you know there are other there are other recreational um uh, activities occurring in the town of arlington that may also you know have these heat index issues and right. i i don't know it, it just, it's it's almost it, like, like personal like, accountability it's almost like you know providing sure. that education yeah and i think yeah i know i hear what you're saying yeah, and that, and that, we just need to figure all. out a narrative. Okay, it, it, and again, it's I'm just saying if if we, you know, if we if we're targeting turf field, and again, like and I know not we are, we're just reporting. I understand that, but if turf field becomes all right, we're going to, you know, um, you know, make Arlington safer by not having turf fields due to the um, the wet bulb temperatures, right? Yeah. Um, then we just have to, it has to be consistency about that health policy with everything that we do. Cause I, you know, it, it, with playing tennis, again, although I know that's not our charge, but and as Mike says, it's not something maybe we have to worry about per se, but it is, this is going to become a document that people are going to read and go to for factual information. And I'm telling you in this document, if we say that we're not going to allow certain things because of, you know, the wet bulb temperature being X, I'm going to get it from my camps. You know, are you having camp today because of the wet bulb temperature? Are you going to the playground today? Are you going to close the, 
you know, whatever today, because we're all temperature. So I know that's not our charge. I'm just, I know what could be coming. Um, and so that's why I just want to make sure whatever we, mitigation measures we recommend, they're, they're attainable, yeah. you know, across all levels. That's all. Yeah, Thanks, can, I I really jump in? can I jump in for a second? I mean, I hope I'm not saying something controversial, but I might be. Um, so I've seen some comments in the chat, uh, you know, in reference to what, what, what Joe's talking about. And I guess what I'd say is artificial, from what I've read at least, and I'm assuming it's probably what folks in the health group have read about heat because it sounds like we have some overlap on the heat issue. I, you know, artificial turf, particularly with crumb rubber infill, is leaps and bounds hotter than any other surface. Natural grass, asphalt, anything. So this concern that, you know, well, if we're starting to say that you shut down a artificial turf field because, you know, it's got a wet bulb temperature, well, you know, it's well, then why aren't you shutting down the tennis courts and the and the and the regular field? Because they're not even close. <laughs> they're not close. And by the way, that's what crumb rubber infill, though. That's what crumb right. rubber that's infill. Right. Exactly. We're that's talking, right. we're talking like 70, 80, 150 degrees <laughs> warmer in some cases than than a natural grass field. Right. It's which I which I mean again, though, is so those we've, as we've talked about, and they've talked about it, you know, it can be mitigated. Because through the color of the infill and the type of infill and whether it i forget what ian said it was maybe a a, a green sand i think he said and i think the temperature that he indicated please correct me if i'm wrong it wasn't as far off it was still hotter but it wasn't as natural grass was it 20 degrees it was something like yeah. that it wasn't I mean, brock brock you know at least the brock industry fill. says brock fills only about 20 or 30 degrees right, right, warmer right. You know. so yeah. I, I, again and and like i've said from the start like we're going to we're going to report all these facts based on potential crumb rubber infill. Not all these, but we're going to be across the board. But if we have no intention of ever using crumb rubber infill, then the wet bulb temperatures issues of being eighty to ninety degrees warmer aren't issues. Do you know what I'm saying? And they're so not then issues. They're not issues for us. They are us. issues in other locales potentially right. Right. but those are not our issues what we we were specifically saying is that regard regardless of surface type in the summer we are going to get to the point where we we have to have some mitigation and so you know the high school is going to have tons of turf fields that i assume the rec department uses so how do we have like the football team being shut out of practice in August because of the temperature? And like two days before we have little children playing on the same field. So what we're looking for is regardless of field type, some consistency around temperature play would be a reasonable mitigation. Um, and we, you know, we spent a lot of time in the heat group saying, yes, turf, depending on what type we use may be hotter, but, we felt like heat is an issue regardless of surface type. And, you know, I, I get the point that like going into like basketball courts and playgrounds gets cumbersome, but if we're, if we're using this as part of fields, can we make some, some recommendations specific to fields? Um, no, I, yeah, I understand. I board. totally understand. Yeah. And I just said, and I know Marvin wanted to get on this too, I, I think. Um, even though I, I, it's my, based on based on the discussions we've had over these last few years, I don't think there's anyone in this group who's pushing for crumb rubber info. Uh, and I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say part of our recommendations are going to be that if you ever have an artificial turf field, that's not one of the options. Um, you know, we're, we're just, ultimately we're a study committee. I mean, for all we know, Maybe that is on the table for someone, you know, a crumb rubber infill. And and so we want them to be very, I, I know what you're saying, Joe, which is like, why are we wasting so much time on something that no one here, no one here supports? And, but, you know, we, we don't know. We don't know on the next level, you know, a year from now or whatever, when someone's looking at these options, maybe someone is going to push crumb rubber infill and we, we at least can turn to our report and say, well, you know, here's the data on that. And it's not very good when it comes to heat. 
And I totally understand that. And again, I, I probably a broken record and I just should shut my mouth and can let it continue with the bullet points. But I think my issue is that those who might not believe that synthetic turf fields are appropriate in Arlington, they tend to reach for the arguments that are on the upper echelon of the argument, meaning the crumb rubber impacts. And whether that's crumb rubber impacts on heat or whether that's the crumb rubber impacts on um, the infill you know, migrating from the field or whether it's that the impact on the runoff into the streams for the fish, you know, and so when you're when you're having a discussion with someone about the benefits or not of artificial turf field, in their you know discussion points are all based off the most extreme circumstances, and my discussion is based on the the mitigation measures that we are going to undertake. You know, again, whether that is Brockville, whether that is not by any stream that has, you know, some type of a uh, wetland species in them, or whether that is, you know, uh, particular, um, the fields built in a way to capture any potential, you know, um, migration of the infill material or whatever it might be, it's two different discussions. And that's what I just, I think somehow the report I would hope would kind of bring the center and not focus on those kind of extreme points. And maybe I'm just confusing myself now, but anyway, that's just my concern because I've had discussions as a recent, no matter what I say, everyone brings up these, these um, you know, horrible turf stories or, or, or fears based on the worst case scenarios, something that we would never build. And the, I know we're just the reporting the facts, but maybe there's a way that we could report the facts and maybe we're doing this. So I think maybe we are on our way, um, but we're just we're not gonna recommend chrome rubber. We're gonna recommend a material that um, doesn't get as hot, doesn't migrate as much, uh, so on and so forth. So that's all I'm saying. Marvin, do you still wanna get in on this? Yeah, I just I I don't want to go into this a lot because I you know I feel like we've we've talked a lot. I mean I, I feel like ultimately what we're doing here is we're just trying to do research and get information. Um, you know when you talked about you know the difference between say the high school field and pickleball courts or whatever, I think in part there's a difference between organized sports and something that's you know kind of purely you know like more of an adult voluntary activity. Um, you know, if you've got kids practicing, they're going to be practicing and, you know, it's kind of up to what the coach wants them to do. And, and you know, having coached, you know, myself for six years, um, you know, I think there's and and also in terms of temperature, if you've got football players and pads and helmets, that's a very different, you know, kind of heat situation than would be, you know, something else. So I think, you know, these are all things just to think about. Uh, I don't think that any of us are saying you know, in this report, you know, we must do this or we must not do that. Um, I don't think that's the intent of this committee. Um, my sense is we're just supposed to kind of do research on, on you know, elements of, you know, things that might be impacted by, you know, artificial turf and bring them to town meeting. And ultimately, town meeting or the select board or whoever is going to be making the decisions. Um, you know, it's certainly not for me to wave my magic wand and say, yes, we will do this. We won't do that. Um, and I, I think I probably everybody feels the same way. I think so. But no, I just what you're saying. Marvin, I think you may you may be up next for the next item in your group. Yes. Group. Okay. Um, are there any? I mean, does anybody else have anything else on heat or all? Oh, we'll get another bite at the apple on heat when when the safety group presents. So don't worry about heat. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so um, I am going to be talking about kind of the uh, potential chemical issues around artificial turf. Um, and I'll just start with, you know, working off our bullet points, you know, the various routes of exposure to any chemical, you know, are basically, you know, ingestion, inhalation, and dermal contact, whether it's some kind of allergic response or <clears throat> something that actually will pass through the skin and become a systemic issue. Um, the health concerns are, you know, risk of toxicity. Um, there are carcinogens that we are concerned about. 
um, some of the chemicals in that we find in artificial turf um, in both the infill and the blades and you know the the underlying map. Um, we have endocrine disruptors and reproductive system um, you know toxins. Um, in terms of you know major chemicals of concern, and and I'm not going to go into this in a lot of depth because I you know I could spend hours doing this and, and I don't think that that's productive right now. But um, you know chrome rubber is obviously what has been used by and large um, in most turf fields. Um, I you know believe that we you know may have some chrome rubber and we do have chrome rubber in town. Um, you know one of the big issues with that is is these are ground up tires so they have all the materials that are in that uh, we've got polycyclic arom aromatic hydrocarbons um you know many of which are carcinogens now these exist everywhere um if you burn a steak on the grill you're going to have pahs so you know it's not that they're only um in rubber products but you know you can breathe them you can eat them there are any number of ways that we can expose to them um you know and you know, skin, lung, bladder, liver, gastrointestinal cancers as a result. Um, this is a huge issue for firefighters, um, you know, because of the smoke that they encounter when they go to fires. Um, and obviously, I don't think that anybody on the field will be exposed to that level, but these are toxic materials. Um, there are some heavy metals in there also, lead, zinc, chromium, um, some of which are carcinogens and some of which also have assorted other health effects. Um, PFAS. PFAS is a big deal. These are forever chemicals. Um, they're found in all kinds of, you know, synthetic materials. Um, you know, if you've got Teflon pots and pans in your house, you've got a potential ingestion exposure to PFAS. You know, you mentioned dental floss, um, you know, rain gear. Um, there are, you know, the, there's PFAS everywhere in our environment. Um, we drink it, we breathe it. Um, while a number of PFAS compounds have been banned for use in consumer products, there are thousands and thousands of them that are still out there. Um, the issue with PFAS is they don't degrade. They, they're called forever chemicals because they don't really break down. And so they're going to last forever. Um, we do have drinking water standards uh, and, and some new ones coming up that are going to be a little lower than the previous ones. Um, but we all, you know, if you took samples of our blood, we'd all have, you know, you know, perfluoral alkyl compounds in our blood serum. Um, you know, the adverse health effects of PFAS, you've got alterations in metabolism, different, you know, thyroid function. Um, it's been, a, you know, high levels of PFAS exposure have been associated with people being overweight, um, lower fetal growth rates, and actually, you know, kind of a little diminishment in the effectiveness of our immune system. Um, the other thing that's in almost all plastic are phthalates, which are plasticizer compounds. Um, these make plastics more flexible and, and also provide some other, you know, you know, some other qualities to the plastic. Um, and again, it's not just, they're not just an artificial turf. They're in all kinds of plastic materials, um, you know, personal care products, um, sporting goods, um, some some food packaging materials. Um, these tend to be, you know, they dust are a problem, and particularly for kids who crawl around and you know put their hands in their mouth. Um, anyone who's watched a toddler for two minutes knows, you know, what toddler behavior is like. Um, so it's thought that this may be, you know, more of a hazard for um, for kids and for adults. And again, um, and their endocrine system, <clears throat> excuse me, disruptors. Um, there are other, some other organ systems that seem to not function as well. Um, there are some child growth and development effects that are seem to be associated with them, and also some reproduct reproductive system effects. Um, you know, we all are exposed to both phthalates and PFAS all the time. Um, so one of the problems is, and, and this is one of the, the struggles with this group, there's a lot of information out there about toxicity of materials. And there's very little information about exposure. There just haven't been a lot of studies done. Um, and for both PFAS and phthalates, there's no, there, there has yet to be an established medical limit that says, you know, below this level of exposure, you're okay. Um, you know, above this system, you know, above this level, you're not. Um, th this is an area that 
virtually every paper ends with, we need to do more research in this because we don't know enough. Um, you know, so this is a problem. Um, one of the issues just, you know, as an industrial hygienist is I'm forever seeing chemicals that we thought, you know, once upon a time weren't too bad and turn out to be, you know, really quite hazardous in the end. Um, you know, trichloroethylene, which is, was a, which is a solvent that gets used virtually everywhere in industry, um, is one of the chlorinated solvents that's a carcinogen. Um, all these chlorinated solvents originally came in as safety solvents because they weren't flammable. Um, and using them meant that shops were less likely to have fires that were going to burn them down. Um, but the ET EPA is currently trying to completely ban its use in the country um, just because of its carcinogenic potential. Um, bromopropane is another solvent that gets used in, in vapor degreasing in, in you know, machine shops and other metal things. Um, it was introduced initially as a safer solvent and safer than the chlorinated ones. Um, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists in 2005 set a level for workers of, as, as, of an average of 10 parts per million. Um, the, the, the level right now that they've established is 0.1 part per million. And so, you know, its toxicity has been recognized over the years as being much greater. So the, the exposure level is 100 times less. So, you know, while we don't have a lot of information about exposure or exact toxicity levels, um, I think that it's appropriate to be cautious and just to kind of think, you know, things may not be as, as inert as we think they are. Um, microplastics was raised. Uh, again, we're, we're all exposed to this just because of the uh, enormous amount of plastic materials that are out there. Um, there was a big article in the New York Times today just talking about how difficult it is to recycle medical products and, and the hundreds of tons of, of you know, medical products that, that we don't know what to do with now. Um, one of the issues is the plastic particles themselves, which have uh, seems to, at least mostly in animal studies, show adverse health effects. Um, but things also glom onto these plastic particles um, or, or, you know, different chemicals are introduced into the plastics. And so that becomes another issue. Um, last September, the European Union banned added microplastics in consumer products and included in the ban things that can generate um, microplastics during use, which includes crumb rubber. So um, the EU has basically eight years to phase out crumb rubber completely. Um, you know, in, in terms of artificial turf fields. Um, in terms of mitigation, uh, you know, there are other infill materials which appear to be much less toxic. Um, again, there's been very little work done on, on looking at them. We don't really know what's in them. Um, it's safe to assume that pretty much anything will be safer than crumb uh, at this point. And so that would be something to use. Um, in terms of the PFAS issue, um, I saw a presentation on PFAS a couple of weeks ago and called up the woman who was the, you know, kind of the head of that study. Um, her company did some work for Portsmouth, New Hampshire, because there was an issue of um, people having tested samples of a supposedly PFAS free field and, and finding compounds in it. Um, so I called her up and, and had a long chat with her and her concern was that because it was a field that had been installed, that it was probably contaminated by PFAS in the air and rainwater that had, you know, kind of brought these particles down into the turf. And it really is not viable to do PFAS testing on a field that's been installed. So her company did work on a sample that they got from the manufacturer. And, you know, her take was that they found only, you know, little tiny trace levels and that from a functional standpoint, there was nothing there and she didn't see that that was, um, you know, a significant exposure risk at all. So I think it's probably possible um, to, to get PFAS free turf or, or mostly PFAS free turf. Um, but again, it, it, it requires sampling before it's installed just to prevent any contamination. Um, uh, I'm not sure, you know, what else people would like to know. Again, the, the big issue is that people have looked primarily at crumb. They've looked primarily at cancer as an outcome. Um, they haven't looked at, you know, at other things like, you know, asthma or endocrine disruption or reproductive system disruption. 
Um, and it's very hard to do this sampling. Um, you know, if I'm doing air sampling for somebody in a workplace, I'll hang a little vacuum pump on them and it connects to a cassette that clips under their collar and that will suck in air that's representative of, of you know, their breathing while they're doing that. This is not, unfortunately, something that you can do with kids playing soccer or football. Um, so the challenge is going to be coming up with methods to, you know, to develop new sampling methods. There are some that are underway. Um, people are using silicone wristbands to, to look for certain chemicals, um, but there just hasn't been enough work on it. So, um, you know, we're in a position of, of knowing that something has adverse health effects and not knowing quite how much we're exposed to in the course of, you know, you know, working on fields. And, and this this is the huge dilemma for us and, and basically for everybody else who's doing research in the field. So well, thank, thank you, Marvin. I, I'm, I'm struck by, you know, one of your comments uh, just talking about, you know, crumb rubber and, uh, you know, it, it just reminds me that in all these issues, environmental issues, it's sort of a game of whack-a-mole, right? You'd come up with one solution and it turns out to be a, a new problem down the road. You know, at one point, it was a miracle, right, that you could find a use for old tires. And the miracle was, oh, you put it in old tracks and you put it in artificial turf and everyone thought this was such a great thing. And, you know, now we know more than, you know, yes, it's a great second use for those tires, but is it really a great second use? I mean, uh, from what we're finding, not so much. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, our perspective is only as good as the research, you know, in the present day. And, uh, but having said that, I think we can all agree that research in crumb rubber is not very encouraging <laughs> as, a, as an infill. Right. Uh, yeah, so alternatives, do. you know, really can't be any worse. Uh, and, and in some cases it could be much better. Um, any yeah, other question? Yeah, Sorry. We're all, we're all subject to the law of unintended consequences. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> Um, any questions for the health group, which I think did a great job with these bullets and, and explaining them tonight. Okay. Well, Come on, Leslie, anything. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just busting your chops a little. Um, and, and, and just, you know, just, just to Joe's point, I mean, the problem, not going us, there. we know that there's a lot of bad stuff here, but we truly don't nobody really knows at this point exactly how much we're exposed to and nobody knows exactly how much is a problem you know and this is this is our dilemma in in, in like wading through all this material looking at this you know that we're kind of left you know it's kind of like you know johnny carson with the envelope you know it's all we can do is kind of you know hopefully make educated guesses about things yeah well, uh, I think we'll move on to safety, which you'll see some uh, definite overlap. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, when when we merge all of these together, um, I mean, first off, the goal is for it to read like a report, you know, so it has one consistent voice throughout. But also, you know, I could see us, Natasha, potentially, you know, combining the heat sections and, you know, what we've done on heat and what you've done on heat and bringing it together. And because I think I think there's some overlap, but I also think you've looked at some aspects of heat that we haven't and we've probably looked at some that, that, that you, your group has. And so, um, Leslie and Joe, what do you do you want me to maybe like talk it through when you guys jump in along the way or I'll, I'll throw various pieces to you as I go through through our points? That Sounds work? good. Okay. So, um, you know, safety working group, we, we really looked at kind of three main areas. Um, one is the effect of synthetic or artificial turf on, on user or slash player injury. Um, also as compared to natural turf fields. Um, heat, it's effects, you know, heat effects on players and users, um, as well as comparing it to the effects on, of natural turf fields. And then sort of skin, skin issues, which to some degree can sometimes be injury and sometimes be heat, but sometimes it can be its own, its own element. And we'll talk a little about that at the end. It's probably the area we, we've gone, there's the, 
the least amount of research and we have the least to say, but there's still some important things to say. So, um, you know, some introductory points basically that, you know, artificial turf or synthetic turf, you know, we, we use the terms, uh, you, know, you know, interchangeably you know, present a series of questions about, you know, the use on the, on, on the, on the, on the user, on the user, whether you're talking about a professional athlete or a casual user. And uh, as part of the charge, we, we looked at artificial turf or synthetic turf's impact on player injuries, things like head injuries, concussions, you know, tears, breaks, sprains, ACLs, you know, ACL injuries, um, heat stress, skin abrasions, bacteria infections. You know, in general, we'll, we'll kind of sort of give the headline up front and then explain, you know, we find that the artificial turf is basically taking great leaps and bounds from the AstroTurf days. Um, you know, when you read about the original, and, you know, by the way, AstroTurf, which is sort of the very first synthetic turf, isn't that old. I mean, we're talking something from the, you know, 60s and 70s. We're not talking about something that's been around for, you know, you know, 100 years. We're talking about something that's been around at most 50 years. Um, it's, you know, those early AstroTurf days, which in many people's minds is still what they think of when they think of artificial turf. I mean, the technology behind synthetic turf is, has jumped leaps and bounds, and that includes the technology around how its effect on, on the people who use it. Uh, I think everyone would, would agree, uh, who lived during the early days of AstroTurf or read about it, AstroTurf was pretty terrible when it comes to, uh, effect on the users. And that's why, frankly, the industry, you know, had no choice but to make it better. Um, but even with those improvements, you know, modern synthetic turf has notable limitations uh, in comparison to, you know, professionally maintained natural turf fields. But we think, you know, limitations that could, that could be managed or mitigated. So, you know, moving on to the injury piece of this, which is something, you know, we haven't heard about from other groups. Uh, as I said, you know, artificial turfs moved on, taking taking great leaps since the AstroTurf days, particularly with respect to player injuries. And, you know, recent studies on these player injuries provide a mixed picture. Many of these studies we looked at, and Leslie was fantastic in finding some really good research here, a lot of peer-reviewed studies, uh, some, some from, you know, a decade ago, some from just a few years ago, some from this decade. Uh, provide, you know, an interesting, but I would say mixed picture um, on synthetic turf and its effect on, on, you know, user injury. And, you know, some studies see a greater likelihood of sports injuries with artificial turf over grass. Other studies see the two playing services as basically equivalent when it comes to injuries. We actually saw one study, interestingly, that showed the, the actually artificial turfs uh, were safer than natural grass fields. And we'll sort of suss that out a little bit, but um, I mean, one of the one of the key pieces here, and Leslie is always uh, on me to, to, to mention this, and she should be on me because it's a really important point. You know, a lot of these studies look at um, synthetic turf, synthetic turf versus, you know, um, ath athlete level, you know, professional athlete level, uh, professional sport team level, uh, natural grass fields. That is, you know, an interesting comparison, but it's probably not a very relevant one for Arlington. I mean, we're never going to have an NFL style or FIFA style or natural grass field. I think Ian Lacey made this very clear that for us to do that, that would probably be half of Arlington's, you know, annual budget, you know, to keep to keep these these fields as pristine as as you would have at the professional level. So you know, you have to look at these issues of artificial, especially with player injuries, artificial turf, and compare it to um, natural grass, you know, fields that are maintained well enough, but not nearly at the level of, you know, to call them pristine. I mean, it's just not possible for a municipality, uh, really any municipality. So, you know, we we will talk more about, you know, these studies when we hand in the narrative section, but, you know, we also look to the experiences <laughs> of, um, sorry, Leslie, were you trying to get in? I didn't... Sorry, no, I have, a, I have a little cold. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, we look to the experience from the athletic trainer at the high school and, you know, with, with her, the benefit of her experience, 
you know, she said she's really not seen, consistent with what we saw in these studies, any measurable difference in the type or number of injuries associated with, you know, the playing surface. You know, some more frequent types, injury types are just attributable to, to factors like differing physiology or player preparedness. Um, there was a very interesting um, piece that uh, I want to thank Mike for sharing with us. It was written just a couple of weeks ago from Mass General Brigham, from the head of uh, the director of, I, I believe it's their um, sport, sports science, uh, you know, sports medicine and orthopedic surgery um, uh, office. And, you know, it's a very lengthy piece and it's very interesting, but, you know, at the end of the day, he sort of comes out and says, yeah, I, if I had to have preference for what my kid would play on, my preference would be they play on natural grass, but I can't tell you today that there's any more or less likelihood of, of, of a player being injured on, on um, natural grass or synthetic grass or natural grass or vice versa. Um, you know, what we do find is, you know, it, it's just hard to definitively say one is better than the other. I mean, I think there's definitely natural grass has probably more going for it and, and maybe a little, a little more going for it in terms of, lesser effects on player injuries. But, um, you know, what we've seen is there seems to be a slightly higher risk of foot and ankle injuries in artificial turf fields versus natural grass fields. But the difference isn't really dramatic. There's some indication that was with respect to um, sports injuries, um, artificial playing services might be better than natural glass, natural grass, including maybe in the era of concussions. But I'd say at the end of the day, it's kind of a wash. Um, you know, natural grass comes out a little ahead, but not much. And it really depends the study you're looking at. Um, and really the honest assessments from, from people who know this stuff very well say, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but six of one, half a dozen of another. Um, and there's just so many other factors that go into player injuries that, um, you know, you're not, if you're looking to player injuries to kind of decide which direction Arlington should go here, it's not going to tell you too much. And Joe, Leslie, anything you want to add or anything I got wrong here? Any no, questions but... about, yeah, Mike? Yeah, I think it, what you're bringing up is so important because there's so many variables involved in safety on artificial versus natural turf. Uh, it's really hard to nail down a specific definitive answer. And I think that's important to realize that uh, that that may not be a deciding factor. But I think that, you know, what's the age of the player? What's the sport of the player? What's the what's the maintenance been on the field, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that you're right, that it's very hard to come down with a clear, definitive answer. I think that's important to note. Well, and Joe, Joe, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I mean, you had you had an anecdote about your own family, right? Like um, injuries, sports yeah. injuries in your own family. And, and for you, it was also sort of a wash, right? Unfortunately, I've had the experience of three ACL tears with my daughters when um, uh, one was on uh, one was on turf and one was on um, natural, natural grass and both were non-contact injuries. And um, they just, yeah, so that's my own personal, like it's happened on both. So I think it's more of the genetic makeup of my daughters than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And, you I know, it's speaking to what, you know, Ian said last week, I mean, it's also about maintenance of artificial turf too, not just natural grass. You know, sometimes, you know, we think artificial turf is set it and forget it. And I think what we learned from Ian last week was um, not so much. I mean, you have to maintain an artificial turf field too. Otherwise, you know, things either get, you know, sometimes the, the blades get clumpy, which makes it easier for, for, you know, cleats to get sort of stuck in them. I mean, there's there's a lot of, you know, a well-maintained synthetic turf field could also minimize, um, you know, the risk of injury just as much as a well-maintained um, natural grass field can minimize injury. Yeah, my it's daughter really well had an ACL tear and it wouldn't have mattered if it was natural or artificial turf because she just got tackled and dumped yeah. And uh, that did it in, so it wasn't going to hurt. It matter which turf it was on. Yeah, Jill. Um, I was just I I listened to Ian's 
presentation just last night and I don't know where this goes and maybe it is in this section. I What I took away from Ian's presentation, I, I took away that sand was a good alternative in fill, but the other thing I took away was that regardless of field type, maintenance has to become a greater priority. Um, and you know, I personally didn't realize how much maintenance an artificial field had. And now I'm reading Phil's um, comment that that's usually part of the contract and warranty um, that fields are tested for performance. So where do we put that like, or inform town meeting members that like, regardless of the field type we're selecting, maintenance has to become a priority if we're gonna invest in any type of field. Um, and I don't know if this goes in like the beginning of our presentation or if it fits into safety, but I well, feel I like, think it, you know, I think it's peppered throughout, but I think okay. it will be, have to be a clear part of, you know, any executive summary or conclusion, conclusion, okay. you know, conclusion section. I mean, I, I, I think we'd be doing a huge disservice if we weren't honest with town meeting and the select board about, you know, maintenance is, is just so essential to this discussion. Um, because I do feel like, you know, we we talk about maintenance, we say the value of it, and then we often kind of do a set it and forget it type thing with, with, with fields, right? Like, you know, especially synthetic turf. Um, and everything needs to be maintained. Our, I, I've been um, screaming and, and yelling for many years that our outdoor public assets need to be treated in a much, much, much better manner. Uh, you know, we don't do maintenance. We don't, we don't do maintenance. We, for many years, we haven't done maintenance of our town buildings. We didn't do maintenance of our public schools. Uh, we have a town hall with a roof that is falling in and that um, they're gonna be taking the clock tower off of uh, because we haven't, done adequate maintenance but we really haven't done or found a way to do maintenance on our outdoor public assets and for many many years uh, joe and the park commission have been talking about it and have been trying to get people involved and they're they're you know i know now um in in claire's department we've got you know, David Morgan, who has uh, looked at uh, land management. Um, a second bite of the apple is coming on that because it didn't completely take a look at all of our outdoor public assets. But that's that's just a, a major issue for the town with respect to parks, playgrounds, playing fields. Um, so many gardens, our public spaces need maintenance. Um, yeah. and, and I think people understand that, but that the commitment to that can be overwhelming because yeah. um, there's a lot to, to have to focus in on there. And, it, and it's costly, regardless of how you do it, it costs, or, you know, yeah. whether it's, whether it's your in-house, you know, we, we no longer have a department of natural resources that we used to have back way, way many, many years ago um, before Prop 2 and a half came into being. Um, you know, the town had a department focused on natural resources and that got cut. And funding uh, just isn't a prior, hasn't been a priority in that area. So, it's coming yeah. home to roost. Leslie, like, and that's a good point. And I, I was actually had a someone from the finance committee reached out to me today to ask me this very question. And I kind of gave him a very long-winded answer. But if I were to tell Arlington's population, 44,000 plus, how many people we have in the parks department that probably say, ah, 20, 25, 30. We have six. Six people maintain all of our parks, playgrounds, um, the Wait, fields, please. the common areas, the library. I mean, you know, there's some a little bit of it's contracted out, but 
six people. So you have someone mowing the grass, someone lying in the fields, someone empty in trash, someone um, uh, grooming the ball fields. Uh, there's a like a maintenance worker, and then someone is following up with a backup more. One, two, two more. One on one side of town, one on the other side of town. That's it. And then you talk about you want to pull resources for town day. You want to pull resources to beautify um, Mass Ave. You want to pull resources to do you know a number of things that just come up. The issues that just happen in life. You have six people. So I think when you're talking about committing to a maintenance program, yeah, it might be a different um, form of fertilizing, whether it's organic or non-organic, it might be, you know, going with someone, uh, like Ian's company that certainly can provide you with, um, a list of different services that you could put on a field, but you need the people to do it. And I think that's where, um, a bulk of the monies come in. If you were able to even double the parks department size, and then you could really spend time in training in, 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 in uh, you know, spending the time that each field needed. I mean, that's one element. And the other thing is resting fields. I don't want to, I don't care if we double our parks department and we increase the budget by, you know, five times. If we don't have the ability to rest the fields and they're being used, um, the amount of time that they're being used now, there's, there's, there's really not much an increased maintenance program is going to do if you're using them from 3 p.m. to dusk, you know, seven, five days a week, and then from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. on some cases, the weekends, you know, from mid-March or say April 1 to November, you know, with a little bit of a break season in the summer when nothing grows because it's so hot. So it's, it's, um, you know, just, just really got to keep that in mind because I've heard that a lot. We need more maintenance. We need more maintenance. It's a much larger issue than just throwing another $200,000 into a fertilization program. I'm going to keep things, I think it's a good point, Joe. I'm going to keep things moving and move on to heat. And I'll keep this actually moving even on a faster clip just because I know we've already discussed a lot of the heat with the health group. Um. So we've looked at heat too, but, you know, much more, less from the chemical side and more from, you know, the, the just player player safety side. Um, you know, as we've said, this is one of the few areas where there's wide consensus that, you know, artificial slash synthetic turf is going to be much, much hotter, uh, particularly with crumb rubber infill. But, you know, even the alternative infills, the early indications are they're still hotter. They're just not as hot. Uh, as from rubber infill, but, you know, we're talking, you know, much, much hotter. And we've seen with crumb rubber, we're talking could be, you know, as much as 80 degrees hotter uh, than natural turf on a, on a hot, sunny day. Um, you know, we believe the heat related concerns are, are very capable of being uh, mitigated, especially in a community like Arlington, it's in the New England climate. Um, you know, the heat related concerns over the artificial turf fields in New England would be, you know, most acute in the, you know, the, the months you'd think of, right? The hottest months of the year, June, July, August. Um, and for Arlington, you know, installing new or retaining existing artificial turf fields of any kind, we believe should require, you know, close monitoring of, you know, wet, you know, wet bulb temperature, air and surface temperatures of those fields every day of their operation. Um, you know, if surface temperatures climb above a certain established level, then those fields should be closed, you know, to all uses for that day. And what that level is, you know, is something to be worked out. But, um, you know, and but, you know, and as Leslie points out, much like natural grass fields are closed when rain or snow conditions prevent their use. I also use the example of, you know, we need to start thinking about artificial turf fields to some degree, like we think of, um, you know, beaches. You know, beaches, people go out there and you know, <laughs> DCR or probably at the Arlington Res, they go out there and people test and make sure it's, you know, the bacteria levels are low and, and there's not red tide or any of these things. And uh, and that, you know, people can come out and use them that day. And if it's a day where the levels are high, it's you can't use it that day. And people just accept that. Um, you know, in the same way, if there's a 98 degree day outside and, and the field temperature at an artificial turf field in Arlington is, 
you know, 170 degrees, obviously that's not a field that should be in use that day. Doesn't mean it can't be used every day of, you know, September, October, November. I mean, you know, you have to just sort of know that there are going to be certain days of the year where you're going to have to monitor these things. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't have an artificial turf field, at least on a heat related issue. Um, doesn't mean, you know, because there's a few days of the year you can't use the field that you shouldn't have the field at all. At least that's, you know, on the heat, how we came at this. Um, you know, for Arlington's uh, at high school level athletic programs, you know, local field conditions, we know are monitored regularly by the staff. We learned this from, from the athletic trainer using, you know, the wet bulb temperature readings during warm days in August, you know, we were told that the artificial turf temperatures can be about 10 degrees warmer than natural grass. That's been at least the ex her experience. And, you know, we have things like MIAA to follow. Um, they have existing protocols related to practice and play during heat events. They're actually very good guidelines if you haven't read them. Um, you know, so we're not, we're not painting on a blank canvas here. We have, we have some, some guidance from very good sources here as to, you know, if we did have artificial turf or synthetic turf fields, how we could properly use them and um, and monitor them so that they weren't used on, on days where health or safety of, of users would be at risk. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about just other alternative infills like, you know, wood chips, coconut house, cork, brock fill. Um, now we've heard about green sand. Um, we just don't have a lot of published research as the health, health group noted we don't have a lot um what we have in many cases is industry data but the industry data is encouraging it's not going to ever quite get to natural turf levels in terms of heat mitigation but um gets a heck of a lot closer to it um and is worth we think exploring much more than you know crumb rubber which you know there has been researched the heck out of and none of it seems very very positive. Um, so before I move on, I mean, I know we've talked a lot about heat, but Leslie or Joe, do you want to add anything or? And we'll flesh all of this out, obviously, in our narrative section and cite to a bunch of studies and, you know, best practices and what some other communities have done. But that kind of gives you kind of the high level view of, of heat. You know, lastly, we looked at skin and bacteria issues, which, you know, have relationships to both the heat and player injury, but can sometimes be seen as a separate category. Um, you know, artificial turf fields, when you're talking about very hot fields, um, you know, it raises the risk of skin injury from the high temperatures. We saw, I think we've seen some, some data that shows that, you know, if the temperature is above a certain amount, like 120 degrees, I think, you know, skin skin being touching that surface for more than 10 or 20 seconds i think can be enough to to start to you know get a get a serious burn um but you know once again this is one of those things where that sounds really horrible but then you realize like well who's using these fields barefoot you know who's using these fields um you know who's who's keeping keeping their hands or their bare feet on these surfaces pressed against them for 20 seconds at a time on 120, you know, when they're 120 degrees. I mean, this it's, it's, it's not a great um, scenario, but it's also an unlikely scenario for us. Um, and there are ways to mitigate, like proper signage, directing users of the field to wear shoes at all times, or, or as we said, limiting or closing the field to use on the hottest days of the year. You know, the, the synthetic turf fields also raise questions about bacteria infections including um, greater prevalence of turf burns and skin abrasions compared to natural grass fields. But, you know, what we find is that the threat of bacteria infections from, from these, you know, synthetic or artificial turf can be, you know, mitigated just through some pretty good hygiene practices, you know, washing skin abrasions with soap and water, you know, immediately or as soon as you get home. You know, there's medical guidance, I think, from Mount Sinai, you know, that says uh, those who play on artificial turf services, you know, just best practices come home, wash your hands before doing anything about eating, drinking, or, you know, adjusting mouth guards, you know, as well as cleaning cuts and abrasions immediately. You know, I'd also mention, and this relates to both he and this and sort of skin abrasion issues, you know, there are some very, um, you know, I guess, clickbait stories, you know, about people who have been on artificial turf fields and seen their, you know, on hot days, seen their cleats literally melt. Well, you know, I don't deny that that happened. Um, 
but now we we've read those stories we we'd read a collection of them they're almost always from texas florida california and they're almost always um on extremely hot days in extremely hot places um you know i don't personally worry about someone using a synthetic turf field in arlington and having you know their cleats melt on them. and if they and if there was ever a day where that was a possibility I think what we're saying is that's a day no one should be out on that field anyway. Um, so, you know, this is back to the cautionary, you know, you read interesting things, but you always have to have things in context. Like, you know, a Texas artificial turf field isn't going to have much re relevance to an Arlington situation if we had an artificial turf field. Um, I don't know, anything, anything, Joe, Leslie? I mean, that's sort of a, a very high level set of our you know, where we've been looking and what we've been looking at and, and where we're kind of going with the research. Or any questions from anyone else? Well, we either did a fantastic job or we've totally missed the mark, but we'll find out soon enough, so. <laughs> um, well, I think we've all gotten through the bullet, each of the group's bullets. I know it's getting late. Um, Natasha, I can't remember what's next on the agenda. Oof. Yep, me neither. <laughs> um, I just had it in front of me and I just lost it. So give me one tiny second. We may be um, deliverables project timeline. Uh, I think that's where we're at. Yes. So yes. we left. Really that was sort of where I naturally wanted to go, but um, it's yep. good to know that's the next item on the agenda. Um, so you know, we have a deadline this Friday. It's a, you know, coming fast on the, you know, fast on the heels of, of the um, the last deadline, you know, and it's because we had to compress deadlines of the narrative sections, which, you know, based on the, based on a lot of, you know, the, the bullet points we received, you know, it's certainly going to be more work, but I like the direction everyone's going in and hopefully it's just putting meat on the bones. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's this Friday. Um, Mike, I, I received your email. I'll, I'll reach out to you. I think, I think we'll be good to have a, I'll reach out to you, but I think we'll, I think we'll be able to, to find a compromise there. So, uh, Thank don't, you. but, but in general, you know, um, if you haven't ready, send them this Friday. I, I, I think I'm a little hesitant to have a meeting next week while Natasha and I kind of take in the everyone's sections and start to go through them and kind of piece them together. And we could have a meeting, but it, I don't know really what, I don't know if everything would be ready to be shared at that point. Um, I don't know, Natasha, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea where we haven't received a lot of, um, it, it seems like this group is fairly on point it doesn't seem like anyone is really disagreeing or feeling like we need to dive into any additional areas um so i think it probably makes sense for us to try and put all of those narrative reports into one um and then share it out what do others think or we can just do the sections and everyone can uh review each section but i feel like we've kind of already done that with the bullet points it might just be more helpful if we're able to kind of get together that draft document that includes not only like the introduction, some of those extra points that, um, you know, we wanted to, to get in there and then just have like that kind of a review. I don't know what folks think. Joe. I just got a quick question. And just, um, uh, uh, at, so at this point, and I know it's cause I, I, you know, I think um, Phil Asker, you know, sent some things to Natasha and, you know, as far as um, someone else reached out to me about potentially being a, a speaker, are we done collecting data? So uh, at this point, so we're still collecting data and then over the next couple of weeks, we can still modify. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think the only right. point of not um, meeting next week would be so that we can have sort of that final document. And then when we do have that next meet meeting, we would have that as well as any additional information. And at that point, if, you know, there were things that we felt as a group we wanted to include or elaborate more on, we would still have some time to do that. Um, I think that was sort of the thought, but I'm good either way. Well, and I, and I, I warned the group that, you know, at every deadline after March 1st was sort of um, TBD, 
because you know we're just I don't want to say we're going to be winging it but at, at that point it starts to you know when and how we meet will be a little more we'll we'll obviously always give at least 40 hours notice before our meetings but um and obviously try to do more than that but um I think we just kind of have to Natasha and I have to start sorting through the deliverables and figuring out how we turn this into something it doesn't you know what's the old joke it, you know it reads like it was put together by a committee you know that <laughs> it actually doesn't read like it was put together by a committee that actually you know someone reading it it actually flows and and you know makes makes the points that are each of the groups are making but in a way that you know re, you know reads consistently um and then you know we have to talk about kind of big picture like what we do want in an executive summary or as a set of conclusions or recommendations i mean i i I myself have thoughts about where we're kind of all seeming to move with this, but I just, you know, we want to be sure all of our thoughts are on the same page and that, you know, if we stand, if we can all stand behind something, it has to be something we can all stand behind. Um, so, um, you know, I know someone in the chat mentioned that there isn't a Warren article to extend our, our timeline, you know, our deadline to October. Um, and I talked with the sponsor of that, you know, before before she filed it. And I think, you know, she filed it with very good intentions. The intention of, you know, it gives us that if we needed more time and we didn't ask for it, we wouldn't be able to get it because the warrant would have closed, the warrant would have closed, and we would have missed the opportunity. So it was sort of more of a fail safe. You put it in there. If we don't need it, we don't need it. And if we do, there's something there. My goal is still to not need that. Um, my goal is to get this report done uh, before town meeting. I, I have to admit, I'm not sure it will get done by March 22nd, which technically the Warren article says 30 days before the start of town meeting, which would be March 22nd, Friday, March 22nd. Um, I think we can get this report done before the start of town meeting for sure. Um, but, you know, uh, we may need it to, you know, especially if we want a meeting for public you know, potentially some public input. I don't want to rush that. I don't want to cut that out. So, um, you know, we may be looking at something where we need, you know, maybe we finish our work in early April, which is still well before the start of town meeting. And I, and if we were to go that route, I think I'd want to send a letter to the select board and the town moderator, just letting them know, technically we won't make, meet the official deadline, but we will get this done before town meeting, which to be honest, I think was the real intent. I think the 30 days was kind of just an arbitrary 30 days before was an arbitrary deadline. If we can make March 22nd, I'd like to do that. I just think at this point, you know, I don't want us having to meet every day for two weeks to, to meet that deadline. I'd rather, I'd rather get it right than, than rush it to, to meet a sort of, what's to some degree an arbitrary deadline. Um, so this is a long way of saying stay tuned. Um, We'll obviously let you know. I mean, maybe we will meet next. Uh, I think Natasha and I will try to decide in the next, obviously, day or two whether we will meet next week. And, you know, maybe we still have a guest speaker. Maybe we still, there's still a reason to meet, even aside from um, the work on, on, you know, the bullet points and the sections. But I don't know. Natasha, anything? Sorry, I'm kind of, I'm kind of no, no. going on and on. But no, I think, um, if the group is okay with this, um, well, I guess first, you know, what are people's thoughts? Are, are you comfortable with Jim and I trying to put together just one document so that you're not reading each different section or would you prefer to reach, read each different section? Because I think what's gonna happen is we're gonna end up with a couple of different documents. One is gonna be, well, we'll have three documents, right? Like everyone's narrative section and then we have to put a whole document together. And so to try and make it as easy as possible, we all have to, you know, weigh in on it? Does it make sense for it to be one solid document that you're reading through at one time and then saying, okay, you know, here's where I think we might need to focus more on, or do you want to like kind of do this discussion as it kind of comes up? So I guess that's the first question. And then the second thing is we don't have to make a decision right this minute. We can certainly, you know, in the next couple of days, if, and we can still, we can still meet next week, have a speaker, have whatever correspondence has been received, but maybe we don't have that report all compiled and sent um, out to the group because we're we're going to kind of piece it together so that it's one report. So two things I think I'm asking. One is 
which would you prefer? One single document or all the individual reports? Single. Leslie, I see you single. Jill, single. Marvin? I think single, but I mean, it's it's like okay. if we had two groups talking about heat and, you know, you know, the healthy environmental group talking about chemical issues, it yep. seems silly to, to like do it twice. Right. Okay. So, Mike? Yeah. Perfect. Jim, yeah. I know you are. Yeah. An and and I just want to, I want to assuage any fears. Like you'll still see your work product. It's not like oh, we're going to yeah. be, we're going to be like rewriting your sections to a point where you're like this, who the hell is this? This isn't what my words, where did this come from? I mean, you're still going to see your fingerprints all over this. It's just, um, we want it to flow. Okay. So we are in agreement. We'll make it one document. And so regardless of whether we meet or not next week, that document probably will not be I know it's not going to be ready for next week's meeting. Um, we just, I won't be able to, Jim and I won't be able to compile that in time. Um, so it will be on the following, whatever we meet. We can still have a meeting next week. And if we want to bring in any guest speakers or there's additional material that we would like to talk about, I think um, we can kind of leave that up to the group. We can make that decision now, or we can say, you know what, if there's something that you really want to talk about next week or you want to bring in, let us know by, um, Thursday morning, and then we can make a decision by Thursday at 5 p.m. so that I can have the packet out in time. How's that sound to people? Makes Good. sense to me. Okay. All right. And I know um, David Morgan will be joining us again. Um, and so that will give him a little bit of time to to also uh, sort of catch up. Claire, thank you so much for everything that you've done um, and been here, even being just here. And <laughs> um, I know you're super, super busy and this was probably not on um, your list, but we have certainly uh, enjoyed having you here. And, and I know you'll fill David in very nicely. Um, so so a, a, a last sorry. reminder before we, we just check in on new business and then adjourn. Um, and I haven't done it myself. So it's sort of a reminder to me to make life easier. If, you know, if you've got lists of sources, start sending them to sources you look to or relied on or even just read send them to uh, natasha so she can start building that appendix because you know no reason why we have to wait to the last minute on that um new business anything i just heard something today that i thought sounded a lot better we called the things that we would want to put in place mitigations and i think you use the word best practices and something to me about mitigation seems like, okay, if you do this, then that's okay. Versus best practices, I think is like, I don't know, a bigger picture statement. And so I would just encourage in the, the overall report to to be consistent with that language. And, and personally, I think best practices sounds better. I do. I do too. I will note that the charge uses the word mitigation. So to some degree... We still need to, you know, we'll need to use that a little bit. I mean, you know, I'm we don't need to be slaves to the charge, right? But we we do have to stick to it to some degree. So um Yeah, I'm not sure we can determine a best practice necessarily. I mean, a best practice has a certain um connotation to it that I'm not sure we have the authority real authority to put in place but i think a mitigation is something that you know as it said in in um what we are looking at determining those things that can be done to um eliminate a bad context or circumstance or something um might be the best we can do as part of what we're looking at would be the way I would think of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. The only thing I would note there is that mitigation can be partial or complete or, I mean, right. it's, it's a, there's a range there as well with best practices, you know, who's best practices and based on what the right. same thing as mitigation. So it, it's a fuzzy word, but we'll get there. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Just under new business, I wanted to 
mention um, two things. I put this in the chat, but anyone who sent me any materials that have not been included in this packet, it may have just been because I received them after the deadline, just as a reminder, if I can get the materials. Um, so if we're having a Tuesday meeting and there's no Monday holiday, I just need to have them the Thursday before by five o'clock. I use that cutoff because I can't post the meeting agenda myself. I have to rely on other folks um, to do that. So I have to have it ready by Friday morning. So I'll make every effort to get Anything, if you send it to me at like 435, 450, I will make every effort to get it in there. Um, but anything after five, I really have to like cut it off the Thursday before. So I promise um, anything that was not included will certainly be included. If you felt like there was something that wasn't included and you provided, sent to me, there was a lot of materials this past week. So please let me know. Um, and the second piece that I just wanted to let the committee know about is I did finally speak with the town of Brookline. Um, and I was able to speak with uh, one of the select board members, um, select board member Sandman, uh, who was on the task force for um, a resolution um, in Brookline. And one thing that he had mentioned um, that I, I don't know enough about, and I, I promise that I'm going to give everyone, I'm going to provide a memo with what I have learned from both Malden and Brookline and any attachments um, that, that I promise will be in the next meeting. Um, but one thing that he said that I don't know much about, and I'm wondering if anyone here knows, he said that they had a chemist um, and the chemist had had talked about exposure to PFAS um, and something about the PFAS were different uh, in the artificial turf. He said PVDF versus, I don't even know what that means, but I need to look a little bit more in that. But essentially what, what I got from the conversation was that the PFAS that were in the turf are not the same as the PFAS that are other in other areas are concerning. I have no idea what that means, but I just, I don't know, has anyone come across anything like that? I did a little bit of research and I couldn't find anything. So I don't know what that is referring to, but I'm going to try and look into that. And if anyone else sees anything, um, I haven't seen anything about the PFAS and turf being different from other concerning PFAS. And I think what he was trying to say was that they were smaller particles that were not uh, of concern, but I'm just sharing that to see yeah. if I've heard it. I mean, I don't know. Did he refer to it with, the, you know, specific to the infill or to the carpet? Did, did, Great it... question. And I don't actually have that in my notes. So he did send me some stuff. So I will, uh, certainly look at that but I do see that Susan Chapnick just put something in there so thank you for that I'll I'll take a look at that um thank you everyone um for those comments so I'm glad that I mentioned that and I will try and uh look at that a little bit more but just wanted to share that I'm done with my new business <laughs> any other new items um okay I'll entertain a motion I will put the motion to adjourn second Okay, I guess call the roll. All right, so we're going to go with Mike. Yes. All right, Joe Barr, not here. Uh, who else is in that group that I need to talk with? Nope, okay. Uh, Jim? Yes. Leslie? Yes. Who's the group I'm missing? Us. Jill? <laughs> yes. Marvin? Yes. Natasha? Yes. Okay. Okay. We are adjourned. Keep up the great work, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.